Hello my friends, this is Dr. Sayed Nayar Zakazmi. Welcome to my YouTube channel and in today's video I'm going to talk about an approach to a busy child which is a very common problem in autumn and winter season not only here in UK but all over the world. So without further ado, let's uh, dive into our today's topic and get started right away. Okay. So let's start with approach to a VZ child. So I will give you an introduction. So here in UK, almost 20% of infants, they wheeze in infancy and at least 40% of the children who are less than six years of age have at least one uh, episode of wheeze in their life. Now, by definition, let's talk about what is wheeze. It's a basically a continuous course whistling uh, or musical sound which is produced in the airways uh, during the breathing part. So it's a continuous musical sound which you can either hear, sometimes you can hear without a stethoscope but in most of the cases you have to put your stethoscope on the chest of the child to hear this continuous musical or whistling sound that we call at wheeze and this can be produced anywhere in the uh, during the breathing cycle. Most of the time it's expiratory but sometimes it can be inspiratory as well. Keep it in mind that for in order to listen to the V's or in order uh, for the V's to be produced, it requires sufficient airflow. Remember a child whose, whose, whose lungs are so bad that he can't breathe even a tiny amount of air, they would not able may not be able to produce V's. Now, let's talk about the types and patterns of V's. So V's uh, can be classified in different ways. So there's an inspiratory V's. There is an expiratory wheeze, there is a mixed type of wheeze which is actually inspiratory as well as expiratory and uh, then there are some other types like it can be classified on the basis of whether it's low pitched wheeze or whether it's high pitched wheeze. Now let's start with the inspiratory wheeze. So inspiratory wheeze is that musical whistling sound which you hear during the inspiratory phase of breathing. So as a child is breathing in and you put in the stethoscope and the child the chest is expanding and you hear a musical sound coming through the chest, that is an inspiratory wheeze. An expiratory wheeze is the opposite. It's the same sound, but you hear it during the expiratory phase. So as the child is breathing out, you would start hearing the uh, musical continuous sound. Again, it can be a further type. It can be hollow expiratory where you hear this wheeze throughout the expiratory cycle or you can hear it at the end of the uh, expiratory phase. We call it end expiratory wheeze. Okay, so the child is breathing out at the end of the breathing, you'll hear a uh, musical whistling sound, which we call them an end expiratory wheeze. A mixed wheeze is where you find a wheeze during the inspiratory period as well as the expiratory period as well. Now types based on the um, on the pitch, it depends where the obstruction is. Just keep it in mind, this wheeze in itself is produced by turbulent air flow. So you need some amount of air which should be flowing around an area of obstruction. So let's say if the tubes are straightforward and there is no block, so then the air would be having a straight laminar flow and there would be no sound being produced. But let's say there is an obstruction which could be in the form of narrowing or it could be in the form of mucus plug and if this air goes the force, so if there is an obstruction, so it would make ripples over it, we call it turbulence. So that turbulence when it reverberates, it produces this musical sound, continuous musical sound because air is continuously flowing over it. It makes continuously rumbles or small whirlpools or turbulence and that would produce that uh, sound which we call as wheeze. So you need to have an obstruction. Now, it depends where this obstruction is, whether this obstruction is in the larger airways or whether this obstruction is down in the smaller airways like in the terminal bronchioles or in the respiratory bronchioles. So on the basis of that, we divide them into two types. We call them the low pitch V's and the high pitch V's. Now let's talk about what is low pitched V's. This is also known as a sonorous type of V's or more commonly it is known as ronchi. So these ronchi, these are low pitch rumbling sound and they are produced by narrowing of the airways and it's usually sounds like snoring so it's more of a gurgling or snoring sounds 
what it could be inspiratory it could be expiratory as well or sometimes it could be mixed as well but keep it in mind that it's more of a gurgling snoring sound but it's not that snoring or gurgling which is coming from the throat because in practice i have seen and many people um, would share the same view uh, that many times we hear that uh, from the parents or from the uh, what you call the on scene providers healthcare providers that child seems to have a wheeze and when you listen to them you don't have a wheeze rather that sound is coming from the throat like it's a stutter or it's a snoring or a sound being produced by upper airway obstruction like it could be um, a child might be too much snotty might be bunged up at the back of the nose or they might be having tonsillitis which is also causing sort of a rumbling you know of air in the throat and that's giving a very harsh uh, wheeze like sound which is not actually wheeze because wheeze has to come down from the lower airways so again uh, coming back to the point that we need to see that it is really a wheeze and it's not something else like snoring or or what you call transmitted sounds from the upper airways so ronchi are more like gurgling or snoring sound but again ronchi cannot be heard without a stethoscope you need to put your stethoscope on the different parts of the chest or the lung fields and then if you are hearing more of a like a gurgling uh, low pitch sounds which are most of the time they can be inspiratory as well as expiratory so that is wrong chi and it simply means that there are a lot of secretions mucus plugs in the smaller airways so smaller airways you know if they've got mucus plugs so what happened the air is flowing over it during the inspiratory phase and it's flowing back over it in the expiratory phase also that that gurgling sort of sound coming continuously during the end inspiration and early expiration so that we call as low pitch wrong chi or sonorous type of wheeze okay now coming down to the second uh, type of wheeze which is we call as high pitch sibilant type which is the wheeze proper and that is that classical uh, whistling or musical sound that you hear uh, by putting your stethoscope or sometimes if a, if the child is thin or uh, the what you call the obstruction is in the upper airways as well which are close to the chest wall you might hear it without a stethoscope as well but most of the time you do need a stethoscope to put on the chest and then you can listen with it so these are high pitch so they are quite shrill like you know sort of uh, you know, this sort of uh, sounds which are in the higher frequency so we call them the high pitch so these musical sound again they can be of uh, two types for the two types monophonic wheeze and polyphonic wheeze so monophonic means only one type of uh, this wheeze which is usually fixed in the sense that it might be coming from a particular part and it usually happens because there's a fixed obstruction somewhere in the larger airways or even even the medium airways or smaller airways so there is only one or a fixed obstruction so that's why you are hearing the same type of, uh, of whistling sound throughout uh, the the breath cycle either in during the inspiratory phase or the expiratory phase and this type of uh, wheeze the monophonic wheeze is usually uh, heard when somebody has got a foreign body obstruction so if the foreign body because it's a static object and it's just one single ob uh, obstruction so the air is flowing over that creating turbulence you are hearing the same type of uh, of wheeze again and again in every breath cycles that is the monophonic wheeze because it's just got one for tone to it uh, the other or the most common which we hear in viral wheeze or in asthmatic kids is what we call as polyphonic wheeze. So polyphonic wheeze means that um, there are various uh, pitches of the sound and it is coming because different you know levels of obstruction are there. So you've got like bronchioles here there which are of different diameters and majority of them are blocked by secretions or quite you know significantly narrowed down. So different calibers so it's just like you are playing different types of flutes you know in you're holding them in your mouth and you are playing them so you're getting different types of whistling sound oh that in very simple word is a polyphonic wheeze so polyphonic wheeze usually comes in acute viral wheeze or in asthma or it can sometimes come in other forms of uh, diseases as well sometimes in cardiac uh, problems uh, you can also hear wheeze uh, in heart failure uh, that also that would all that can also be a polyphonic and uh, but remember the common things come first so most of the times when we are talking about difficulty in breathing followed by polyphonic wheeze and usually in autumn uh, season or winter season and there were a previous history think of asthma and bronchiolitis as they are the most common uh, conditions viral wheeze etc
Okay, moving ahead. Now, the question is usually how do you describe a vase? Many times I see um, when I am looking at the notes of my juniors, so usually I see a very strange thing. They usually are draw a diagram of um, two lungs and they put an arrow in between. I don't know whether they want to just to stab or it is sarcastically or what it, what it means or they would simply say, oh, well, V's on the chest. Now, simply writing V's or wrong eye doesn't make any sense because you have to, when you, are here, when you have heard a V's, in your notes, you need to properly describe it. And there are four things um, by which you can describe a V. So you have to describe the time, the location and place of maximum intensity, the pitch and tonality. Now, time is very important. But by time, I mean whether it is coming during the inspiratory phase or the expiratory phase. It's very important because different, you know, inspiratory phase, inspiratory V's can mean a different pathology, expiratory uh, V's can uh, mean a different pathology. Then again, location and place of maximum intensity, whether it's unilateral at a particular place like the upper left upper zone or is it bilateral or is it global. So you have to describe it, whether it is at a particular space or whether it's widespread on the both sides or on one side. So you have to describe the location and the place of maximum intensity. Sometimes you are hearing it, let's say you hear uh, a wheeze uh, bilaterally, but then you, you, you at the same time you hear you, through your stethoscope that is this quite harsh at the left upper lobe or the left upper zone. So you would write in that case that well fine it's an uh, end expiratory V's on both sides with maximum intensity at the left upper zone. So that's how you have to describe the location and place of maximum intensity. So whether it's inspiratory or expiratory, number two, where do you hear it? Where is the maximum intensity of that particular V's pitch? So pitch means that whether uh, uh, it's, a, it's a low pitch, which is a wrong eye, or whether it's a high pitch, which is monophonic or polyphonic wheeze. And um, tonality. So uh, again, tonality, more or less, uh, um, you can say it's, it's, it's almost the same thing. Um, uh, when we say wrong eye or low pitch or wheeze, or high pitch so most of the time they mean the same thing so but again it's very important you have to describe it's inspiratory or expiratory and where uh, you hear it is it bilateral is one side more than the other let's say if you are hearing it bilaterally but one side is more than the other so you'll say oh, well bilateral widespread and expiratory V's left side more than the right or vice versa so that's how you describe a V's and you put it down in your notes so that is very important point especially for the junior doctors um, you know, when they put down their notes, so that they have to write it in this way. And it's also very important from exam point of view when you're taking notes. And I think you have to describe if you find a busy child, you have to describe it in such a way if you have coming across, if you have been given a long case or a short case. So please keep that in mind. Now, before I go on, what I talk about like the common uh, conditions that cause these, I like to I would like to discuss some common caveats when we talk about a VZ child and the first caveat is whether it is really a VZ or not because as I told you earlier many times what people describe as VZ is not actually VZ it might be a simply snotty nose and the sound of a blocked nose they feel like it's, it's a VZ in fact it is not so it's very important to understand what, whether it is really a V's or not. And if it's not a V's, it's very important at the same time that you need to tell the parents what is actually V's and what they are hearing. So you have to clear the misconception. And uh, there was a study back in 2001, which was published in the Archives of Disease of Childhood. Uh, and that study uh, looked at, it, it was basically a survey of respiratory uh, sounds in infants. And they looked at how people parents as well as healthcare providers, they conceived the V's like what they thought was V's and then they found, then they actually looked into that whether it was really V's or not. So when they did this survey and this survey was done in here in the United Kingdom and they found out that uh, one third of the parent, that is 33% of the parents who believed that their child had a V's episode or, or having a V's chest, they actually changed their mind after they were shown the video recordings of a real wheeze. 
So what does that mean? It simply means that 33% of the population mistook uh, something else for a wheeze. So it's very important as a doctor that you should try to know whether it's really wheeze or it's something else. So that is one caveat. So you need to see if it is not wheeze, then probably it is something upper respiratory and you need to give reassurance at the same time you treat the common causes of you know sounds coming because of the you know snotty nose block nose blah blah okay then there is another misconception people think that uh, more harsh the wheeze is or the intensity or if the intensity of wheeze is higher they think that it's a more serious underlying pathology well this is not true it's a myth many times we see that a child who's having a very harsh wheeze has got normal other parameters like if you look at their O2 sets on room air would we'll be having very fine 98 99 percent saturations on room air uh, they would be having a respiratory rate which might be at the borderline at the upper limit or even if it's elevated slightly elevated and you look at the general i mean if you look at the general well-being of the child the child is well he's playing around uh, you might be, might be a bit snotty might be mildly febrile and uh, if you listen to the uh, chest very very wheezy very wheezy but the rest of the parameters are fine so that child is not actually that bad and at times you might see a child who's got a very faint wheeze very faint wheeze but if you look he might be having a very high respiratory rate he sets might be at 90 or 91 percent on room air uh, he might be tachycardic, he might be very uh, severely tachypneic or might be having severe recessions but the chest might almost might be clear sometimes. Sometimes in very severe you know, life-threatening cases there is no wheeze at all because there is no air entry going inside. I told you earlier that you need to have a good air entry to produce wheeze because if the air is flowing so slowly over an obstruction it's not going to produce any wheeze. It needs to flow with a force, with a speed. To produce wheeze so keep it in mind that the intensity of wheezing is not proportional to the uh, intensity of the underlying pathological process so there is no mismatch sometimes you can have high uh, widespread wheeze but the child is clinically well sometimes you will see the chest is silent or there is slight wheeze but you see clinically other parameters are showing a downhill trend that is much more serious patho underlying pathology so keep this thing in mind as well and um, especially uh, for the nurses i need to tell them because they are the one who triages them and they usually panic you know if their visa so remember the 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 process is actually mainly by looking at all these parameters so you look at you have to look at the work of breathing you have to look at the respiratory like you looked uh, you have to look whether there are any uh, retractions you have to uh, look at the oxygen saturations as well and you have to look at the general clinical well-being so you have to look at the overall picture you can't just simply focus on one thing and then getting focused and think oh well now this is proportional to the intensity of the underlying pathology no the overall picture has to be seen that's how we doctors we look at the overall picture and we take clinical decisions the third caveat is about diagnosis of asthma especially in under five years uh, children and in my practice and i think uh, my feelings would be shared by other doctors as well kids who are one and a half years of age two years of age they have been diagnosed as asthmatic I don't know how, uh, how, how how they've been diagnosed because um, uh, honestly asthma is a clinical diagnosis and it's a very difficult diagnosis unfortunately we do not have any blood test or something to diagnose asthma so asthma is diagnosed on basis of so many things like the British Thoracic Society sign guidelines similarly internationally the GINA guidelines uh, guidelines they have made it clear how you diagnose asthma so i asthma diagnosis is made on the basis of this uh, what we call as reversibility of the airway narrowing so there is airway narrowing but it is reversible uh, then there is we talk about diurnal variations of uh, peak expiratory flow rate as well so there should be a variation during the morning and the evening time in the airflow 
then we talk about the uh, high uh, levels of uh, what we call as pheno fractional excretion of nitric oxide so in other words uh, to diagnose asthma you need to have a strong family history you need to look at the temporal patterns or the pattern recognition plus you have to do as i told you spirometry test you have to look at whether there is reversible airway narrowing and you might have to do this fractional uh, nitric oxide fractional excision of nitric oxide now for that you need an older child who can understand peak expiratory flow rate a two, two years old child cannot do oh, cannot like you know blow harshly in a, in a peak flow meter there's no way they can do that so if you don't have if you are not fulfilling this criteria for the diagnosis of asthma it's very difficult to diagnose asthma then again asthma has got different phenotypes like and most of the times under five years of age what we see is a single trigger wheeze which is usually and the trigger is or usually upper respiratory tract infections we call them as viral wheeze in the past they used to call it viral pneumonia or something but again because pneumonia is a word which like which rings alarm bells in the minds of uh, parents so that's why we use the word viral wheeze single trigger wheeze so that's why do not label any child with asthma who is less than five years of age because you have to fulfill certain criteria to diagnose them with asthma as i told you there should be tire and variation uh, there should be more than 12 percent improvement if you give them bronchodilators again how do you know that 12 percent? you have to measure that so for that you need spirometry uh, you have to check the fractional excretion of nitric oxide so all this can only be done in older children so remember asthma is a diagnosis which is for older children uh, even they might be asthmatic i mean who knows but still we do not label them as asthmatic till they are five years of age and we can do all these things before that we mostly classify it as, as a viral base another caveat is no uniformity in treatment strategies uh the bts sign guidelines or i think it's known as uh, bts sign guideline 158 and i think this was revised in 2019 here in the united kingdom and that's a very um, i would say a very um, good document which talks about uh, uh, diagnosis of, of asthma and viral wheeze in adults as well as in children and they've given standard treatment guidelines like they classify these wheezy kids into mild moderate severe and life-threatening and then they talk about what needs to be done if they come to the hospital and what sort of preventer therapy has to be given in a step letter fashion but many times i've seen that uh, the there's no uniformity in treatment strategies uh, some of the kids have been given um, they are given uh, low dose uh, inhaled corticosteroids while other were got repeated um, repeated attacks they are not given anything no preventer therapy uh, some are put on uh, ICS, some are put on Monte Luca. So they're not going in that those stepwise uh, recommended uh, treatment strategies. So everybody are trying to use their own physician discretion, their own knowledge to treat it in different ways. So that is another caveat. So I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very hard question. Like, you know, uh, can't blame anybody. But I think the bottom line is that we need to adhere to the these strategies because these strategies have been made after a lot of research and uh, till we have got something new in our pockets uh, some newer drugs we have to stick to the existing treatment guidelines and last but not the least inhaler technique and it's very important every time a child turns up in the hospital with a viral wheeze or with a wheezy chest and they have been already they are using their inhalers or they have used it at home or they are any preventer always and always check their inhaler technique and mind you i've seen at around 50 percent if i'm not exaggerating around 50 percent of the parents have got wrong technique wrong technique and they would come they would say oh, well you know we have given 10 puffs of um, solbutamol or anything it's not working it doesn't work research has shown that inhaled therapy is as good as nebulized one why is it not working is simply the technique so if you are not holding it properly i guess you're not making a proper seal and things so the child is not taking appropriate amount of that inhaler so obviously 
these are gaseous medications so if they are not going inside an appropriate amount it's not going to exert its effects so inhaler technique is very important so every child who comes in just look at their inhaler technique and rectify if it is so if it's wrong so these were some of the common caveats um, now let's moving on common things coming first most of the time these VZ kids when they come in this VZ chest would be either because of viral V's or asthma but as I told you asthma that we do not label them as asthmatic unless and until they are more than five years of age and then we look at the pattern recognition we look at the temporal patterns if possible we look at the peak expiratory flow rate how much it improves spirometry test and where possible fractional excretion of nitric oxide and if they, if they fulfill all this criteria well fine you can label them with asthma and obviously there's a bit of genetics as well uh, but again, there has been a lot of research on asthma and all these, you know, um, respiratory illnesses that produce V's and uh, there is a more of a uh, debate on single trigger and multi-trigger V's. So single trigger V's, you would see most of the time when they come down, there will be history. Oh, well, he was naughty. He was having cough and cold for the last two to three days or maybe two to three weeks. And all of a sudden now this morning he woke up, he was breathless and progressively worsened over the period of the day. This is the classical history, which I listen every day. So what you hear in the background is a cough or cold, a mild viral illness and then after the third or fourth day or second or third day, the chest goes down. It just invokes a, a bronchospasm episode, it's a Christian thing and they become wheezy and they've got difficulty in breathing. So every time they've got a cough or cold, more so in autumn and winter, they would end up in a viral wheeze. They, it might be mild where they can sometimes treat at home or they might have to bring them into the hospital. So that is viral wheeze. A multi-trigger wheeze is a wheeze which is triggered by so many things. So it could be um, it could be an upper respiratory tract infection, it could be smoke, it could be pets, it could be exercise. So multi-trigger wheeze goes more in favor of asthma rather than viral wheeze. Then genotypes and phenotypes. Now, asthma has got different genotypes. It might be an IgE related uh, where there is a lot of IgE and it's usually associated with the atopy and eczema and there is a strong family history or it might be non-IgE mediated uh, where uh, the IgE levels, if you do, there are blood IgE levels, they are normal, there is no history of atopy or eczema but somehow there is hyper responsiveness of the airways, they are more sensitive when they respond to different stimuli and you've got then the phenotypes as i told you phenotypes you can have a single trigger wheeze you can have a multi-trigger wheeze blah blah so keep it in mind that asthma diagnosis should be reserved for children older than five years of age less than that mostly we call it acute viral wheeze and we treat it as such one exception is very young infants like you know children who are less than six months of age and um they sometimes they also develop with an upper respiratory tract infection they can develop a bc chest uh, with wrong thing or difficulty in breathing we call it bronchiolitis while bronchiolitis itself is a viral illness so technically it's a viral wheeze if it that produces wheeze, it's a viral wheeze but the only thing it's not treated the traditional way because number one uh, you know they are uh, lungs are not very properly developed number two is that uh, at this age there is not enough uh, beta uh, two receptors uh, on the uh, you know, on the, on, on the uh, lung epithelium. So when you if you give them this you know uh, beta two agonist, it's not going to do any you know it's not going to give any advantage to these children. I mean it's not going to produce much um, airway relaxation. Rather it would go uh, inside the blood and it would cause systemic uh excitation of the cardiac muscle cell then they might become more tachycardic and then sometimes you don't know whether this tachycardia is because of some underlying other issue uh like could be because sometimes viral viral myocarditis which is deceptively similar to bronchiolitis or is it because of sepsis anything else that's why we don't use solbitamol in children less than six months of age so that's in another domain bronchiolitis so bronchiolitis uh, has got no treatment so usually you treat them conservatively if the sets are low you have to treat it with oxygen or if they're doing very bad they have to be put on vipotherm or nasal CPAP but other than that there's nothing much you can do with it no matter if the graph would go up for the next first three to five days and then it eventually it goes down so all you can do is put saline drops a bit of uh, feeding support and things like that uh, but other than that you can't do anything so if they need to be admitted 
Uh, we only admit if their feedings are less than 75%. Again, the reason is feeding support because of a block nose and they might not be able to feed. Number two is if they've got a, a complex past history like congenital heart, prematurity, things like that. Or um, the third thing is that if their sets are below 92%, so if they're not maintaining the sets, obviously you have to admit them for oxygen therapy. So keeping that six months group on one side, the rest of the group usually has got acute viral release and it might be asthma as well, as I told you earlier, but then we we would simply not diagnose them with asthma. You treat it, but you don't label them till they're more than five years of age and you can do the rest of the test and find then you are 100% sure that it is uh, asthma. Then there are some other reasons for wheeze as well. Not everything that wheeze is asthma or viral wheeze. So sometimes you can have other um, issues as well. And I will go through that. The list is a huge one. I will go through some of the common ones as well. So some of the kids, especially less than one year of age, who have got uh, repeated episodes of wheeze, even without a cold sometimes, they say, well, he's been wheezing, the child is otherwise fine. But if you look at their past history, there's a history of reflux or there might be a history of poor weight gain with vomiting and other things. So that usually is associated with gastroesophageal reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease. So with the reflux, sometimes, you know, some drops of it can, they can aspirate that and it simply goes down because it's acid. So it invokes a severe spasm of the airways and that leads to wheezing. So gastro, if there is a history of gastroesophageal reflux and the child is becoming wheezy again and again, treat the underlying condition, treat the gastroesophageal reflux. You can then give Gaviscon or you can give a Miprazole or whatever, depending on your local guidelines. You can treat it at that, so, and the wheeze would automatically go down. Inhale foreign body. Inhale foreign body, especially in less than uh, five years of age, especially if there had been history of coughing or choking, though it's not always present. I mean, if the child was playing with other kids and all of a sudden he started wheezing all of a sudden out of nowhere and usually um, if you hear um, if you auscultate them you'll be probably uh, finding monophonic wheeze and if you find a monophonic wheeze do always do a chest x-ray to see if there is one side is over inflated as to the other one and that goes more in favor of a of a foreign body because you might most of the time you can't you're not able to see foreign body on the chest x-rays uh, but the history can suggest, your clinical findings can suggest, and obviously then you have to refer these kids for bronchoscopy to see if there is any foreign body and that has to be taken out. Immune deficiency, those kids who have got some underlying primary or secondary immune deficiency because of the immune deficiency, they get back-to-back -back, uh, infections. Some of them can be even severe as well by the atypical organism and they can be uh, as a consequence of these infections. One thing more, like any child who is wheezing all of a sudden has got a history of allergies and all of a sudden he become wheezy, almost always examine the body for a rash because if there are a rash anywhere, if there's a history of like uh, food allergies, a peanut or any allergies and they have been or there is a doubt of uh, exposure to these things, think of anaphylaxis in that case because you will not only be treating it with the classical bronchodilators, I think you have to use intramuscular adrenaline in uh, age appropriate dosages for these kids who've got anaphylaxis. Cystic fibrosis is altogether different diagnosis. Um, usually they've got a history of poor weight gain right from the very beginning and usually the immunoreactive trypsogen test it usually comes out positive in the very early days and they can have genetic testing for delta F508 gene as well. Anyhow that's altogether a different but cystic fibrosis kids are usually diagnosed earlier They've got a history of poor weight gain and uh, well if they've got visa something they usually have got like repeated respiratory infection so that's altogether a different domain they need to be treated by the respiratory uh, specialist primary ciliary dys dyskinesia that's another difficult diagnosis they've got a hip history of rhinorrhea right from the very beginning so a snotty nose or a runny nose right from the from the time the child was born and they say well he always got a runny nose and uh, usually do a chest x in these cases because it might be associated with dextrocardia as well. we call it cartagenic syndrome and so that can also lead to wheeze because there's constantly dripping of the uh, these you know the post nasal drip and can go down into the here is going to cause wheeze as well bronchomalacia is um, 
you know, there is term laryngomalacia, which causes stridor often on when the child is agitated. Bronchomalacia is a more broader term because it's not only the larynx, you can have a floppy trachea and some upper part of the airways as well. And we call it a bronchomalacia. So bronchomalacia, the, the cartilage is defective. So the airways are collapsing in and out, in and out during inspiration and expiration. That could produce a monophonic and it can be an inspiratory as well as an expiratory phase. And it's usually aggravated by crying. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia, BPD, these are those kids who are born premature, they have been on oxygen therapy for a prolonged period of time and they've got oxygen at home as well. I mean, they, they cannot live without oxygen. So obviously the diagnosis is quite easy, obvious and easy and they can also have these cardiac abnormalities rarely left to right shunts uh, they can also produce wheeze these kids are tachypneic they are tachycardic and uh, but there is no increased work of breathing so they are happy wheezers and um, you might for, uh, you might uh, um, find hepatomegaly as well especially if they got like heart failure or something they can have wheeze if they've got heart failure so heart, heart failure cardinal signs of heart failure they will be tachypneic tachycardic so tachypnea without increase of work of breathing uh, tachycardic and hepatomegaly and post in infectious obliterative bronchiolitis or bronchiolitis obliterans as we call it there's history of very severe bronchiolitis in the past where the child was hospitalized or might even be retrieved to a tertiary care and then after that he's not doing well in terms of his respiratory he's always gets respiratory infections again and again and he's got V so we call it bronchiolitis obliterans. So these are some of the common. This is not a complete exhaustive list as though there are so many other diagnoses as well that could produce V's because it's, it's quite a big one, like ext extrinsic uh, abnormality, structural abnormality. So if there's a way of artery passing over the top of the trachea or something that can also produce V's, there are mediastinal mass which is compressing on the main bronchi can also produce these things. But anyhow, I'm not going to go into details of that. I'm just talking about uh, some of the common things that can produce fees. Uh, this is an algorithm um, of how to approach a child who has got fees. So if a child is brought in where the parents say or the first care provider they say well the child has got fees first thing as I told you earlier is see if the child is really wheezy. Is it really wheezy or not? If it is not wheezy or something else then you consider alternative diagram might be upper respiratory tract infections blah blah blah. Okay fine if it is really wheezy you look at the onset of the symptoms. So onset of the symptoms could be a sudden onset. I mean he was fine one to two days of cough and cold and then became breathless in the morning progressively increasing and then they had to bring him into the hospital. That is the common story. Or there might be a gradual onset of wheeze in late infancy or early childhood and the child is wheezy every now and then and again this time he became wheezy or it could be a chronic or intermittent wheeze. So the child is not fine, so he gets wheezy for a day or two, then he's fine, then wheezy, then fine, has been to GP, has been to pediatrician, everything has come up fine, he's well and thriving, blah, blah, blah. So that's another category. So those who have got acute sudden onset of symptoms, you see whether it was preceded by chorizal symptoms or not. So if yes, if they were preceded by chorizal symptoms, it's most probably uh, viral wheeze. Again, see whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and treat it accordingly with the uh, solbutamol. Uh, you can add eprotropium if they're not responding to solbutamol, and um, plus minus you can add steroids to that. If there was sudden onset of symptoms but no chorizal symptoms, and the history is suggesting that out of nowhere, all of a sudden the wheeze came, think of foreign body, and then. Um, Examine them and you might need a chest x-ray to see whether one side is overinflated. Remember the indication for a chest x-ray in foreign body is not that you would be able to see foreign body unless it is a metallic foreign body. Uh, most of the time it is organics like peanut or something. The only reason that you do chest x-ray is to see if one side is overinflated or atelectasis or something which will go more and you know it is a sort of an indirect diagnosis so you can think of foreign, for foreign body. Uh, those who have got a gradual onset of wheeze and they've got intermittent symptoms then you see whether they've got like um, uh, in between they've got a symptom free symptom free interval or not so if they've got a um, no symptom free then you will be thinking of putting them on some preventive therapy so you treat the acute phase and then at the same time you'll be thinking of putting them on some preventer therapy like very low dose or low dose inhale corticosteroid or multi-lucost depending on which stage they are on. So that's altogether a different domain. I will talk about it um, after one or two slides. But again, you have to treat the acute phase and you have to put them on a reducing regime to take care of this acute phase and then it should be followed by a preventive therapy to make them symptom free. 
Um, if it's just a one-off attack, fine. And uh, infrequent attacks, you just do the acute attack followed by reducing regime and then you ask them to stop till another attack comes somewhere and that it would be uh, dealt later on. Uh, similarly, now coming on to the uh, third category, that is those who have got chronic or intermittent V since birth. Now, if a child is thriving well, then you can think of like, you know, well, could be trank, uh, bronchomalacia or something like that. All is that they need reassurance of it needs workup. They just need referral. They don't need any acute treatment. Those who have got worsening symptoms or who are not thriving well, and especially the uh, research in the last four or five years uh, have been, you know, there is a new term which has come up, which is protracted uh, bacterial bronchitis. We know bronchitis is more common in adults, but recently it has been seen that bronchitis is a real entity in children as well, especially protracted bacterial bronchitis, where it's not an acute pneumonia-like situation. The bacteria is thriving, it's causing a low-grade infection continuously. So they've got a history of wet cough, like they say, well, he seems to be having phlegmy cough, okay, wet cough, and it's continuous going on. Obviously, if it was a developing country or something, you would be thinking of tuberculosis or somebody who had traveled or lived somewhere in the, let's say, in the South Asia or an African country. But here in the UK, the protracted bacterial bronchitis is one entity one should be thinking of. So you give them a trial of antibiotic and see if that works or not. So if they get improved with it, uh, then usually uh, you give it an extensive course of antibiotic that usually goes for 10 to 14 days and uh, then you you know, you know recheck uh, them again to see how much uh, the infection has cleared up. Sometimes if it comes back, they might need more extensive, yeah, usually two to three weeks of antibiotic. But again, they need to be seen by the pediatrician in order to make that decision. So this was in a nutshell, the treatment algorithm. So just keep in mind, just to summarize this, that a child who comes with an acute attack, you classify whether it's mild, moderate, severe, life-threatening. Again, those whose SATs are above 92% uh, and their respiratory rate is normal, and just reveal, these are usually the mild cases, so they can be treated with uh, uh, 10 puffs of salbutamol. And uh, you can even give them a burst therapy where you'll be giving 10 uh, uh, puffs of salbutamol every 20 minutes for one hour and see the response. And they usually, most of the time, mild cases, they improve with that. Uh, then moderate, uh, severe, and life-threatening. Again, uh, the uh, severe and life-threatening have got um, sets less than 92% of room air. The moderate has got sets which have improved, but they've got wheeze and they've got increased respiratory rate and they've got increased work of breathing. But if the sets are low with all this, then it is um, acute. In life-threatening, obviously, the sets are very low. Uh, the child uh, is uh, very much tachypneic, severe recessions, might not be able to speak in full sentences, or the chest might be silent rather. There is no wheeze because the air entry is reduced to such a level that uh, he, the other thing is that that child might be might be very lethargic to the extent that he's almost drowsy, he's not responding to social cues and other things. So that is life threatening. So that has to be treated in a high dependency unit or sometimes things don't improve, they might have to be retrieved, they might have to be shifted to an intensive care uh, unit. Now coming uh, to the treatment. Treatment is with salbutamol. Inhaled salbutamol is preferred. Remember, wherever possible, inhaled salbutamol is as effective as nebulized one. So, 10 puffs of salbutamol are equal to uh, 2.5 milligram dose of uh, nebulized salbutamol. So, it is as effective. Again, research has told us again and again. And you know, in these COVID times, especially when we are more scared of the procedures that are aerosol generating. So it's better if possible to start treatment with inhaled salbutamol. But again, it's a physician discretion if the child you think is not doing well, obviously you can uh, start with nebulizers. And again, nebs can be every 20 minutes or you can give them back to back. Recent research also says that steroid has to be started right from the beginning. So as soon as you're starting them on the first nep, give steroids there and then. So steroids, prednisolone, oral prednisolone is preferred. Oral solutions are better because the tablets, the dissolver tablets, they, 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 they've got a very nasty, bitter taste. Most of the kids, they just spit it out or they just warm it after that. So ideally, 
the proper oral solution of uh, prednisolone should be used but if you have to use a dissolvable table it's better to mix it in juice or something so that, that so that there are no issues with palatability otherwise the, the child throws it out so if the child vomits you have to repeat the dose or then you have to move on to other forms or you have to like the americans they they can use they use basically dexamethasone single dose they can go up to 0.6 milligram per kg body weight or then you have to give IV hydrocortisone in a dose of 4 milligram per kg body weight. So start with prednisolone. So prednisolone is given usually the dose is 1 milligram per kg. Uh, so in general, less than 2 years of age, we use 10 milligram stat. Between 2 to 5 years of age, we use 20 milligram. And above 5, you can go between 30 or 40 milligram of oral prednisolone. And once you start prednisolone, it has to be given for the next three to five days again depends most of the time we use i mean i use it for three days some centers they use it for five days some even use it for seven days doesn't make any much difference they say three days is as effective as seven days course so you have to give them inhaled solbutamol where possible yes severe cases and life-threatening cases where the sets are less than 92 percent straight away start with nebulized solbutamol and again solbutamol can be given alone every 20 minutes or you can add a protropium in a dose of if less than one years 125 micrograms or if more than one year 250 micrograms nep so this is added to solbutamol so in severe and life-threatening uh, you can go to a maximum of six doses of aprotropium in two hours this is the maximum but normally, I mean, we usually go with three, first three, so 250. So in case you don't exceed, uh, uh, for some ages, it is one milligram, for some ages, two milligram, the total dose per day. So you can add 125 if the child is less than one year of age. More than one year, you can add 250 micrograms of uh, aprotropium to every nap in the first two hours. After that, then you have to give solbutamol. Oral prednisolone has to be given in a dose of uh, 10 milligram if the child is less than two years of uh, age and uh, 20 milligram between two and five and then 30 to 40 milligram if they are more than that. If the child is throwing that up and is uh, intolerant of uh, prednisolone, then the alternatives are you can give dexamethasone a stat dose of 0.6 up to, this is a maximum dose, 0.6 milligram per kg body weight or you can give IV hydrocortisone in a dose of four milligram per kg intravenous. If the oxygen sets are low, and please keep it in mind, when you are checking the oxygen set, the child has to be awake. Many times you say, oh, well, you know, they come and they say, oh, well, the child's sets are down. And the child is sleeping. Even if I'm sleeping, my sets would be low. So it's very important that when you are looking at the sets or we're interpreting the sets, the child should be awake. And the sets probe should be on a warm part of the body. If the child is exposed to the cold, he's mortal, and you put uh, like around his big toe, you put, so the sets are going to be low. It's going to be falsely, it's going to show you a false low reading. So the sat probe should be on a warm place uh, part of the body and the child should be awake. So these two things have to be kept in mind. Once you have given them naps, uh, you uh, review them after every round of naps and you look at, again, you look at the O2 sats, you, you auscultate their chest if the wheeze and subcostal resistance, all these things are improving and you look at the general well-being. So once these sets are consistently above 92% on room air. Uh, if that is the thing, the child is generally well, he's playing around, he's looking, he's responding to social cues, then you can discharge the child. Uh, where, but at the same time, you don't stop the treatment. You have to give them what we call an incremental step-down therapy. We call it reducing regime solbutamol plus minus um, aprotropium and a three days, uh, once you have one dose you have given, two dose at home of steroids and you advise them to follow up with a primary health care provider within 72 hours or they might be seen in the community asthma clinic within 72 hours it's important that needs to be follow up so it's very important that you know that once a child is discharged they need to be given reducing regime solbutamol do not stop there and then otherwise it would come back with a vengeance so in some of the investigation remember and caveats related with investigation, chest x-ray is not routinely recommended because if you do a chest x-ray in bronchiolitis viral wheeze, it's going to show you something, a fluffy sort of a shadow around the right cardiac border or something which you might mistakenly take as, uh, you know, a mnemonic consolidation or something. 
so it just acts as a research so it's got high false positive rate it's not routine, routinely recommended unless until the child is very toxic it's got a high temperature and you're thinking of uh, it's got focal crackles you're thinking of pneumonia then it's fine blood gas is only indicated if there is no improvement like you know we normally don't do like as a, as a routine thing uh, only if the child has deteriorated even after back to back naps there is no improvement so you do a blood gas and again it has to be interpreted very very carefully because a child who's been given back to back naps solbutamol so solbutamol is notorious in the sense that it leads to high lactate levels so a high lactate level is not not necessarily mean that the child is not well perfused or uh, there's something sinister going and simply because the child has been given uh, solbutamol and solbutamol actually causes an um, activation of the cyclic AMP levels as well as cyclic GMP levels so there is an increase at the cellular level the metabolism of pyruvate and that turns into um, you know there's a bit of anaerobic like process well. so the lactate rises and at the same time the beta 2 receptors in the liver they are also activated so there is more like breakdown of um, of um, glucose complexes so the glucose release in the blood so you'll be having a high blood glucose and a high lactate and obviously low potassium because solbutum all drives the uh, potassium into the cells so that causes low potassium so if you are looking at that picture interpret it very carefully it might be because of solbutum all and not because of anything else routine hematology and chemistry full blood count UNEs and LFTs we don't do it it's, a, it's a got very low yield unless until you are expecting a bacterial uh, infection the long treat, uh, term treatment as far as that is concerned again as i told you bts british thoracic society and scottish intercollegiate network guidelines revised one 2009 which is known as guideline 158 these are the recommended uh, guidelines and uh, they've got the step up therapy for uh, uh, community management long-term management of uh, asthma and viral V's, and that has to be followed in lactin spirit Remember inhaled steroids, whether low dose or something, they've got less role in viral V's because again, um, in less than children less than five years of age, viral V's is common and research has shown that inhaled corticosteroids has got very little role. Even if they're put on viral, on these uh, inhaled corticosteroids, they do not respond well to that. In that case, you can give Montelukast. Montelukast has got uh, more favorable uh, results in case of repeated viral V's and that can be given in a dose of say uh, in, uh, in and four milligram uh, od dose to be given at the evening it usually comes in the form of sachets and it can be given for six to eight weeks and then reviewed after that uh, especially if the quality of life is being if affected by repeated attacks so montelukast or inhaled corticosteroids they can be given again you follow the uh, the the sign step up guideline the step letter guidelines um, underlying um, contributory factors like uh, say if there is gastroesophageal reflux, treat that. If there is any other factor, accordingly has to be treated. Uh, some people say role of azithromycin. Azithromycin is a macrolide which has got antiviral properties as well. And there has been some research on that. So, well, it uh, reduces the um, severity of um, of viral V's. But again, there are no current. Um, uh, guy, uh, sort of guidelines you know where there is a sort of consensus in other words there's no consensus on the role of azithromycin but some studies have shown a beneficial effect so it's, it's just a physician discretion if they want to use azithromycin in viral V's or not so anyhow this was all about viral V's just to summarize that to first remember these key points ensure that V's is a V's and not something else like a stutter or a snotty nose remember in every child present with these O2 sets, respiratory rate and work of breathing defines and manage, but never interpret sets when a child is, a, uh, is, is sleeping. You have you have to make sure the child is awake. Uh, if you have to start steroids, right, start it right from the very first dose of NAP. So as you are giving the first dose, or rather before that, give steroids. Look for contributing factors. Sometimes it's not clear, might need some workup, and that would require referral to the pediatricians. Follow the sign uh, BTS 2019 guidelines for management. And always check inhaler technique when a child comes in. Before you discharge them, always look at the inhaler technique. We are, as I told you, 50% of them have got faulty technique that needs to be rectified. So that was all about viral V's. If you like this lecture, uh, subscribe to my channel. It would be fantastic. Um, do like this video, share it with your friends, and press the bell icon so that whenever I upload a video, you get the notification. I hope you have learned something about viral V's. Have a good day. Bye.